Good day, Don. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this interview over Skype with me today. You, you know, we've known each other for at least a couple of decades through our involvement with NSPI, now ISPI. But for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live, where you work, and what you're currently doing and perhaps some of the more interesting things you've done over the course of your career? Sure. Guy, thanks for talking to me about all this stuff today. I don't know anyone who doesn't like to talk shop, <laughs> especially to the ones of their own experiences, so thank you. Um, my name, as, as you said, is Dawn Snyder, and I have had a company since about 1981 called Dawn Snyder Associates. And what I have done through the lens of that organization, as well as taking time out here and there to do other things, is performance improvement work through the lens of curriculum design often. So um, I live and work in Dublin, Ohio. Uh, we're having nice cold weather right now. And um, it's nice because in Dublin there's a lot of diversity of industries and I work with clients both here locally as well as people all over the country and the world. So that's very exciting. Tell us a little bit about how you first got exposed to human performance technology or however you refer to it. Sure. Um, I think my first exposure, I joined ISPI when I started graduate school. And I started in instructional systems technology at Indiana University. I got my PhD there. And I joined ISPI because I thought it was really important to balance out some of the research aspects with what was currently going on in the field. And so I joined ISPI. It was recommended to me by some of the faculty and um, have been a member since 1981. And, and that was my first introduction. I think, you know, as my career has grown and changed, one of the main, um, I think, impacts or one of the main inputs for guidance for me about what I should be doing, what I should be learning, what I should be focusing on has really come from colleagues at ISPI, as well as, you know, literature that's published in the field. So that's been a, a very important um, connection for me, or set of connections, if you will. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about who your biggest HPT influences were back then when you first started, uh, whether that's people or books or articles? Sure. Um, so I think, and let me grab, I have some little notes here because my, my, my sharp thinking isn't what it was. So I think um, in the performance improvement space, I think I really have to cite um, Tom Gilbert because that is really the basis of, you know, the engineering worthy performance is, is a good overview um, to performance improvement and where I think the field has its roots. I always like to go back to the roots. But following through, I always followed um, Carl Binder for his work in fluency and his fidelity to, you know, he calls it the six boxes model. Um, but I thought it was a very useful way to operationalize some of the stuff from Gilbert. If you've never actually read Gilbert, it's a, it's it's hard to read. It's, it's, um, it's complicated and there are a lot of formulae in there. And so um, people who take some of those concepts and make them real. Um, Roger Chevalier, um, the late Roger Chevalier, did some great work. Um, he has some wonderful job aids that I use with students that I'm helping bring along in the field, um, as well as, you know, to remind myself that there are a lot of things we need to think about. Um, and another area related to that is performance consulting. So uh, Jim and Dana Robinson, uh, of course, um, Judy Hale, Roger Addison, and Carol Haig, um, taking, you know, the performance improvement lens and figuring out how do we make that real with our clients. Um, and then uh, I do a lot of analysis work. So um, Rob Fauché, uh, you know, Ron Zemke back in the old days, um, Bill Coscarelli and Sharon Schrock, Stephen Kelly. Um, so there are a lot of folks that I think a lot of folks listening to this have probably heard of. They're classics. They have published things. For curriculum design guy, I, you know, we kind of caution you not to do this. But I have to mention you because there's not a lot about curriculum written in the non-educational space. 
And when you're creating curricula for an organization or for a job function, it's really a different, uh, a different animal. And so we can get some of our theoretical basis from these other publications, but you've provided step-by-step -step directions and some really useful tools and guidance. Um, and then Ruth Clark, I think I'd look to for the building expertise and her work in that area. So there are a variety of streams that I would probably label as HPT um, that I try to follow so that I keep my practice current as well as founded in um, the reality of research and evidence-based best practice. Yes, well, thank you. That's a, that's a great list other than that one guy that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, other than that one guy. <laughs> Um, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech or a little spiel on, you know, what it is you do um, to people at cocktail parties or when you meet people at, in your networking efforts and that, uh, how do you explain that to them? Well, the first rule is that a cocktail party never talk about what you do because <laughs> it's really hard to explain. I think um, one of the keys here is keeping in mind that that elevator speech has to change based on the audience that you're, you're with. So if I'm in a mixed group of professionals and I'm asked what I do, I often say that I will work with organizations who have an organizational goal that they, they're not meeting, either because there's some sort of problem or it's, it's being driven due to a change. And I will help them define what good performance looks like and craft the solutions that, that will help people reach those performance goals and get the organizational results. Thank you. Where is your current focus or next focus uh, in learning as a lifelong learner? You know, what, what are you uh, exploring now to keep yourself current? Um, that's a great question. So. What I'm working on right now, last December I got a certification in change management. And one of the reasons that I did that is I feel like in the learning field um, uh, and the performance field, things are changing really very quickly, how organizations do business. And a lot of the learning stuff that we create, a lot of the performance improvement work that we do is focused on supporting a new vision of the organization um, and because the organization has to react quickly to the new realities. So um, last year, my presentation that I did, I, I try to do like one or two every year. It was on microlearning. Um, I'll talk about that maybe later in, in this conversation. And then this year, I'm, I'm looking at how, um, when we're looking through the lens of change, how per our performance improvement focus and our learning focus might be different from some traditional pr approaches that we've used in the past. Um, because I think things are changing very quickly and we need to keep, you know, this, this kind of puts me in a position of examining it and formalizing my thoughts and putting that one on paper and then sharing it back with the community. Is there any uh, a person or resources uh, in the change management world that you recommend for others who might be interested in pursuing that? Um, well, you know, I follow the ProSci uh, company. They do a lot of publishing, a lot of blogs. Um, I also follow what's going on in the OD network um, and uh, look at change man management through the OD space. Um, I don't know that there's a person that I follow so much in change management like I do uh, some of the other areas that I think there are people that I follow so much, but I do uh, try to preference things that focus on evidence-based best practice rather than we did this here once. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the reason I think I follow this company and what they publish is because they're able to consolidate or aggregate experience across a variety of different organizations so those evidence-based practices level up to the top. Excellent. Let me shift gears a little bit here to uh, terminology. Um, one of my standard questions in these interviews is, is there a favorite HPT or other term or phrase that you would like to define for us because of how it's being used in the field presently and perhaps you would like to recast it and its meaning um, do you have some term or phrase that you can share with us? 
Well, I think the way I would answer that question is just to note that it's a pet peeve of mine when someone takes a term and defines it through their own lens rather than understanding how it's been used in the field. I think there's a lot of confusion, um, especially for um, emerging talent. Because terms are used differently, they're used differently in different contexts, and that's probably to be expected with any applied field, applied science, and that's okay, I guess, but um, it's something to be careful of. The other thing that, that I would probably just want to underscore is that when a term is used, you can't assume it means what you think it means. Mm -hmm. Well, in my work um, out and about with clients and even with other team members, I think I spend a lot of time working with these teams to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And I don't care what we call it. Mm -hmm. um, I have projects where instead of a needs assessment, we call it a bagel project because people are so sensitized to the experience I've done. Discovery, confirmation, needs assessment, performance analysis. I, I really try not to get so focused on what the term is, except to make sure everyone on the team is calling the same thing the same thing, and that we're functioning in such a way that we're bringing our science forward so that we can um, get the result that we want. And then when I'm working with students, I try to make sure that everyone understands, everyone in a class or in a system understands that this is the terminology that you'll use when you're doing the research. Um, this is where you'll look for those concepts or evidence-based based practices. And um, as you know, because of the question that you're asking, that can be a bit of a challenge for all of us. Yes. No, but I think that's an excellent point that you should work to help everybody come to a shared understanding of the language that we use because we it's so often misconstrued and just miscommunications and... We think we know what each other is talking about, but we often don't. And there's nuances there, perhaps, that sometimes are missed. And it's helpful to get that clarified. Very good. Okay. So in uh, the last part of our interview here is to uh, have you share with us some stories of people that have uh, been influencing you in your life that you've come across. And I'm looking for either humorous stories or serious stories um, trying to share with the audience some of the people uh, that they may want to begin to follow or uh, read uh, th these people's thoughts on that. So you've told me that uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about Roger Kaufman, about Bob Mager, and about Judy Hale. So where do you want to start? So I would start with Roger Kaufman. And these aren't really anecdotes about their behavior at parties or things, but just... Um, sometimes at a point in your career, you hear the right thing from the right person, and it's very helpful. So um, with Roger Kaufman, you know, he was always very supportive of graduate students who didn't go to his university, and he always made it a point um, to offer, you know, words of encouragement and um, specific support if that was uh, available to him to offer. And as I read his work, because one of my first areas of interest was needs assessment, he was one of the few people at that time who'd been publishing on needs assessment, you know, he was talking about societal goals, and I'm like, I don't have to worry about societal goals. You know, my work's in a company, this is where we need to stay focused. Um, and it honestly took me a good 10 or 15 years to really understand um, so one of the things I would I would say, um, my lesson learned from from all of that is that sometimes you have to read things more than once. Um, when you get to different positions or you've reached a, a different level of your own proficiency, to really understand the depth and breadth of what some of our thought leaders have to offer, um, as well as, of course, making sure you're not taking on board things that should not be taken on board. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a, there's a lot of discussion about things like that. So um, Roger Kaufman is one of those who I, I found personally encouraging, so I persisted. And because I persisted, I was able then, I think, in the fullness of time to get a better understanding. And I won't claim that it's perfect yet, but, um, you know, we really do need to think about society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. Things. We can make those decisions as individuals, and then in our field, of course, we can make a huge difference. 
Um, and then um, I think the other story I would tell is about Bob Mager. I met him in a conference in Atlanta, an ISCA conference in 1985, and we were just having a casual conversation, and I was, you know, I was a fangirl, so I was like, wow, you know, this is really amazing to have access to someone whose work you've read about. And one of the things that he was talking about was that he learned something new every year. And he was talking about how he and his wife had taken up roller skating that year. And I'm like, holy cow. But, you know, that's a lesson learned that I took on board. And because I do a lot of work with emerging talent and I do a lot of work in learning, the learning space specifically, um, and we know from our research that almost always a solution set for performance improvement has a piece of it, at least, that's going to be training. I try to approach something that I'm a novice at at least once a year and try to master it. And it reminds me of a couple of things. It reminds me that we don't start out, it's, it's humbling, right? We don't start out as masters of our own experiences or that of others. And when we're helping other people along, there's kind of a fullness of that experience we need to share. Um, another element of that is that um, it forces you to refresh yourself. So this year, I want to become a certified ham radio operator. I want to get my ham radio license. Um, and, you know, some, some years my goals are more lofty. You know, I might, um, I made these earrings. That was one year. I want to know how to make some jewelry. I mean, so it can be just about anything, but I try to be intentional. Mm -hmm. Every year to tackle something um, that is not necessarily related to my field in order to be a learner and remind myself what it is to approach something fresh. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's my Bob Nager story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Judy, you know, I've got a lot of mentors. So, you know, there, I could probably tell a million stories, but Judy is someone who's um, been influencing my career since the day that I met her. And I can remember, um, I knew her before 2001 or 2002, but she was the director of certification for ISPI. And she was talking about ISPI's new certification that was launched in 2001. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, whose work does it really represent? I'm not sure that I would need, you know, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that. And Judy looked at me in her own very direct and no-nonsense way said, that train has left the station. And I, I, I had a moment of realization at that point that I had put up the barriers, but the field had gone on without me. So I might want to talk about how it should be done, why it should be done, where I am in relation to it. But in the meantime, people were embracing the certification and getting on with their lives. And so um, I made it a priority to get the certification, and I, I sure am glad that I did. Excellent. Very good. Um, you say uh, because you've worked with a lot of emerging talent and a lot of uh, students, I would imagine, um, could you share with them through this video uh, any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you would give them as people enter the field? What, uh, what do you have to say to them? I really do have some ideas that I think would be helpful to emerging talent, and I'm going to position that in the context of the fact that I joined uh, Franklin University in 2008. It was the one thing that encouraged me to step away from um, my business because I wanted to build a master's degree in instructional design and performance technology, and that kind of opportunity comes along about once in a lifetime. So I've worked with a lot of emerging talent. And one of the questions that seems to be ubiquitous is, you know, why performance technology? Um, and Franklin has since, you know, changed it to learning technology because there's a huge focus on that. Um, but frankly, learning has to be about performance. And all of the efforts that we make have to be focused on getting people to do things differently. Performance is complicated. If it weren't complicated, we'd, we'd all be within three pounds of our ideal weight most of the year and, um, you know, very physically fit. And so I offer that, you know, often as an example. It is worth learning about 
what performance is and how the specific activities in your day-to-day job or your day-to-day work fit into the framework of performance technology. And I would offer um, either Tom Gilbert, or if that's not as accessible, um, Darlene Van Team, Jim Mosley, and the, the late Joan Dessinger published a book uh, on introduction to performance technology, which really nicely encapsulates, uh, and I think they're on their third edition now, but it, it really nicely encapsulates, you know, what performance technology is. And then you can figure out how that affects your own practice and and what you would do about that. And I think um, the other thing related to that would be embracing evidence-based best practice. A lot of people have an experience, one experience maybe 10 times um, within one company or one organization, and they say, oh, here's the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is the lens that everyone should use to do their work. And I think um, when you start getting these little one-off or these um, um, perspectives uh, that take on a life of their own but aren't really based on evidence, you can really put yourself in a position of of rather than helping your clients or moving your practice forward, but actually doing harm um, by bringing the wrong thing to the table. So those are things that I would, I always encourage emerging talent to find things that are really good and follow those. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, again, uh, agreeing to do this video with me and um, best, uh, Wishes as you go forward and continue your learning and uh, learning new things. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I knew I knew the story about Bob Maker doing that, and uh, um, but it's it's a great practice to embrace. I probably should take it up myself. But uh, Don, thank you again so much for this, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, guys.